I already showed you the, the lions and the bears, and so these are the tigers. So, oh my. <laughs> so here you can see the, the tiger that's there. And, and they try to at least now, they don't put them in a cage where they march back and forth. At least they kind of let them go around a little bit of an enclosure so they're not totally caged up. And there he is. He just he wouldn't, wouldn't pose for me. So. And of course, here's the lions. They give them a little platform. They just kind of sit up there and roar. It's pretty impressive when you hear them roar. I mean, you can hear them on the other side of the zoo. And so I don't think I'd want to be out on the savanna somewhere when I heard that roar. So they're just kind of sitting up there surveying all that they own. And there they are again. I was trying to get mid-roar there. She was trying to roar a little bit. Uh, there they are again. Okay, so we're going to talk about orbit. All right, so first of all, when we define the orbit, there are seven bones around the orbit. Brad, tell us the bones around the orbit. Um, there's maxillary, okay. uh, sphenoid, ethmoid, lacrimal, palatine, frontal, and zygomatic. I lost count. I think that's seven. That's <laughs> seven. Okay. So also when we when we look at the orbit, we break it into different parts. So Tina, what are the three main areas of the orbit when we talk about the orbit? How do we subdivide it? So you have interconal, extraconal, um, and then I think the third designation is just the like the periosteum. Yeah, subperiosteal, it's a potential space. It's not, it's not a real space. So when we think of, of conal, I mean, basically the muscles and the intramuscular septum forms a cone. And so when you look at it, you know, you look at the orbit, you've got the tissue that is within the cone, the intraconal um, tissue that's there, and you know, the muscles form the cone, and the muscles have intramuscular septae that go around them. And, and all around from the apex of the orbit, to the back of the eye, the intramuscular uh, areas is what we call the intraconal space. Thus, you know, the name, it's shaped like a cone because, you know, the orbit is, is a cone. So what's the most important thing that lives in the, in the intraconal space? The optic nerve. All right, so the optic nerve, anything else goes through there? Mm -hmm. and, uh, like, the axis and the cone too, but we also have, like, vessels. Um, okay. So remember, the ophthalmic artery runs through there. All the branches of the ophthalmic artery run through there. The vein runs through there, the optic nerve, and, and, and a lot of fat, all right? What's in the extraconal space? Um, a lot of fat, and there's the subday uh, left there as well. Yeah, so really not a whole lot going on in the extraconal space. I mean, a lot of fat, really not, not much else. And then, of course, we call the subperiosteal space of potential space. And so because we've got these sinuses right next to the orbit, you know, below it you've got the maxillary, you've got the ethmoid, you've got the frontal above, you know, the spaces between here, if you do have an infection in there, you do have a tumor in there, you can get invasion into the orbit from something going on in the sinuses. And the problem is, is this subperiosteal space can fill with blood, it can fill with uh, pus with inflammatory cells, and so that is a, a potential space. And here we can see it just in a different view. Now, this is a sagittal type of view. And you can see right here the bones, the globe, the intraconal space with the optic nerve running through it and the vessels that are there, extraconal space, and then, of course, the subperiosteal space will be right along here. This just shows it on a scan as you show you the, the closeness of the sinuses that are nearby. All right, now there are other things that live in the orbit. Caleb, what, what are we looking at right here? So this is an anchored gland. It's a bilayered cuboidal with uh, acid arc uh, type appearance of these glands. So it could be a lacrimal gland, most likely. All right, so lacrimal gland. Where does a lacrimal gland sit? So it's a superior temporal. All right, so superior temporal. So we've got a main lacrimal gland. We've also got a palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland, and that's kind of split by what? Septum. Okay, so the septum kind of splits the two, the two. So when you look at it, this is just, it's a straightforward lacrimal, it's a straightforward uh, eccrine gland. It's got these acinar spaces here. If you look real closely, there's the little 
pink granules, little secretory granules in the cytoplasm of the, of the little acini. All right, so the hardest part about the orbit now, the eye we're lucky in that when we have difficulties going on in the eye, we can look in and see them. But the problem is the orbit, you can't see the orbit. So, I mean, Boopy really pounds you hard about your examination and how you examine the orbit and how you can get information before you just jump in and do a, you know, do an MRI scan immediately. So, what are we seeing right here? Okay, so describe it. So look at where the light reflex is here, and then look right here, it's just a little bit higher the light reflex, which means that that eye is actually coming down a little bit. So subtle finding, but important. What else do you see there? There's a little bit of fullness to the upper, uh, like, sulcus of the left eye. It's hard to tell if it's left eye, I'm not sure. Well, if you look, and, and you look at that, just kind of the wrinkling that's going on right here, if you look up here, look at that, you kind of lose the wrinkling and you get an idea that there is a subtle fullness in here. Okay, so obviously, what did we just show prior to this? The lacrimal gland. And so where does the lacrimal gland live? It lives up here. So whenever you see someone when they've got a subtle fullness here, superior temporally, it looks like they've got a little bit of hypoglobus, maybe the eyes being pushed down, you would be concerned about the possibility of some kind of a lesion in the lacrimal gland. And when you look right here at this scan, sure enough, there's a lesion here. What does this look like? Oh, I'm sorry. We're still yeah. we're coming around. So back. Yeah, sorry. Um, so we've got a, a pretty well circumscribed uh, mass in the uh, temporal aspect of the left globe there. And, and so the key is well circumscribed. So it's not spread out all over the place. It's not molding around. The, the globe, the muscles, the tissue, it's the, some people would call this a coin lesion. And so you've got this well circumscribed coin lesion kind of in the superior temporal orb, but what would your concern be? Pleomorphic adenoma. Right? So indeed, what is pleomorphic adenoma? Um, so uh, it's uh, also called a benign mixed tumor. Okay. All right, so the reason why they call it that, it's got proliferation of both. And so you look, here's the glandular elements, and they can even form little tubules of these glands, and then in between, though, you have the little myointomal cells proliferating either. And so um, it's called a benign mix. It's a mixture of both. A pleomorphic adenoma is the proper word. Now, when in the olden days, when I was a resident, we were taught the 50-50 rule. And so we were taught that 50% of all lesions of the lacrimal gland are epithelial lesions, and 50% of those are the benign mix, the pleomorphic adenoma. It turns out the first part of that is just not true. If you really look at... Oh, my battery is dying. Oh, that's good. It needs to tell me my battery is dying. Thank you. So it turns out, when, especially when you look at the data that the Shields have put together at Wills, that probably 80% of, of lacrimal you know, lesions are really like lymphoid-type lesions, be they lymphoma, be they um, decroadenitis. And so it's really not 50-50. But if you look at actual tumors from the lacrimal gland, 50% of them are the benign mixed. And so the second part of the 50-50 rule is true. And if we look at it a little bit higher power, here's the kind of ductal glandular elements, and then in between, you get proliferation of the cells. Oh, man, that, this must be one that Vaish took a picture of, you know, it's just bad. <laughs> Obviously, a fellow took a picture of that. You know, it's interesting, on my screen, it shows up pretty well. And on the screen up there, it, it's all washed out. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the difference between the two is. But, if we look close up here, what I'm trying to, to illustrate here is that most of these lesions are what we call benign mixed, but you can also have a malignant mixed. And the setting of a malignant mixed is usually when the um, surgeon is not able to get all of the tumor out, and there's remnant tumor there, and then that tumor can continue to keep regrowing. And what happens in that setting is that the cells can get a little bit more aggressive, and so you can even go from a benign mix to a malignant mix. 
So when you look at these lesions, when you look at them, that first um, you know, CT scan we showed, these tend to almost be encapsulated. Now, they don't have a really true capsule around them, but as they grow slowly and push out, they tend to be pseudo-encapsulated. And so when you're going to remove these, you want to not do an, an excisional biopsy. You want to do a, a, not an incisional biopsy. You want to do an entire excisional biopsy. So you want to remove these in their entirety if you think it's a tumor. You don't want to just do a little piece of it because if there's some left behind, then they can start getting more aggressive and start to take on more malignant characteristics. And what I was trying to show you here is there is more uh, pleomorphism in here. There's starting to be nucleoli in here. And so these cells are becoming more aggressive as they become from a benign mix to a malignant mix. And here's a close-up here. Here's a nucleolus. Here's some clump chromatin. And so these cells are getting more aggressive. You still have that glandular pattern that's going on here, but they're just becoming more aggressive. So if you leave a benign mixed in there and you, you do some surgery, you let it grow and come back, and there's been a couple of cases we've seen where there's actually, they thought they had it all and then it came back, and, and it's actually been documented over time that these will become more malignant looking and more aggressive looking. All right, what do we see in here? Last picture, but just more dramatic on the left eye. There's um, inferior um, or inferior displacement of the globe, proptosis, and then the, there's a little bit of edema in the upper and lower lids. Um, All right. So this just looks it's, it's a lot more dramatic than the, the previous one was. But again, what you're seeing is you've got an idea that there's still some fullness up here, and there's still something pushing that eye down. And so you're still suspicious that something is going on in here. And now you look at the scan; it's still kind of coin-like, but you still got a little, maybe some tails coming out here, so not quite as circumscribed as the previous one. What would your concern here be? Um, so I think your differential would be like something um, malignant versus inflammatory um, versus maybe less likely infectious. All right, so let's say this was indeed a, a tumor in the lacrimal gland area. What tumor would you be concerned about? So we talked about, you know, benign mix, pleomorphic adenomas. What's another type of tumor that can occur in the lacrimal gland? Uh, adenoid cystic. Adenoid cystic, all right. So adenoid cystic is another type of carcinoma that can occur from the lacrimal gland. It's less common than the pleomorphic adenoma, but it's more aggressive. And, and these can be quite nasty tumors. And when you look at them, these are the tumors that people use the term disarmingly benign. And what I mean by that is, when you look at the actual cells, they just don't look malignant. You know, usually look at cells in, in malignancy, they'll have nucleoli in them, they'll have mitotic figures, they'll be really nasty looking. You look at these, these almost look benign, and that's what's real difficult about this particular tumor is the cells themselves look benign, but in reality they're not. They can be quite aggressive. I know, do, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Mike, I'm the new intern coming on. Ah, welcome. Welcome, Mike. So when do you take over the VA? Uh, starting yesterday, I began the takeover. Um, hey, break him in well. Yeah, yeah I am so, trying. So the new interns, you get uh, reprieve the first day. So you don't get pimped today, but next week you're still liable, okay? Oh, you can go for it. I'm ready. Oh, you ready? Oh, yeah. good man. Oh. <laughs> now, remember the last time someone said ready bring... Ready to be pimped, not ready to get it right. Remember the last time somebody <laughs> said bring it on, that, that you know, big banner, bring it That did, really didn't work out yeah, well. No, I don't know if it worked out for me, but... All right, so what are we seeing funny here? I mean, tell me what you're seeing here. Just describe it for me. Oh, uh, gosh. So I think... <laughs> Centrally, you've got some collections there of cells that look like they're proliferating. Um, you've got those kind of cystic spaces, right, the white. Um, and then um, you've got the connective tissue kind of build up around the supporting tissue there. What do we um, see even more than connective tissue? What's this stuff? Bone. It's invading. Bone, exactly. Space. So this kind of disarmingly benign looking tissue is literally invading into bone. And so there, it's important that you realize there are different patterns to these tumors. And sometimes, you know, you can get what they call, this is what we call the Swiss cheese pattern. You know, so you get, it looks like Swiss cheese, literally. And so you've got this kind of Swiss cheese pattern that you can see. And 
Yeah, and this is again this one. This one Caleb took. So <laughs> a little bit of a Swiss cheese pattern here. Now there is one pattern of this tumor that I really want you to remember, and it is called basaloid. And the reason why you want to remember this is when you look at all of these tumors and they say, okay, this is an aggressive tumor, this can metastasize, this can invade into bone, the basaloid variety is the worst. So when you see this, it almost looks like kind of like a basal cell carcinoma. It's really highly cellular. It's not that Swiss cheese. It's not that cribriform pattern that we normally see, but it's this solid basilar pattern. These are really um, aggressive. So these are the ones you really want to watch out for because these can be particularly aggressive and particularly nasty. So we like to try when we look at these tumors to subdivide them into what, you know, type, what, what particular subtype of tumor they have. And so it's the basaloid variety of these that is the most aggressive. So these are the ones you definitely don't want to see. All right, so, so Catherine, before you go back to oh, <laughs> medicine, ugh. <laughs> We go back to medicine here next week. What do we see in here? Um, so you see also some um, fullness of the upper, mostly the upper, but also lower lid of the right eye. Um, and then it looks like um, looks like there's also some erythema and um, also loss of wrinkling. Okay, and so we look at the scan on this one. Now, this scan looks different than the last two. What's different here? So you don't have a well circumscribed or coin lesion. You, the infiltrate uh, looks like it's wrapping more around the eye than um, being more focal. Exactly. So rather than being these coin or these really localized lesions, this is more diffuse. And people call these silly putty. And I don't know. Does silly putty still exist? Did you guys have silly putty when you were kids? Okay. Say so no. You can. Yeah. You know, you can mold it around all the stuff that you can do, and it molds around everything. And so the idea is when you see a lesion that's molding around things, it molds around the globe, it molds around the muscles, what would you be concerned about here? Um, so you'd be more concerned about, um, like, a lymphoma. Exactly, or a lymphoid lesion. And that's what you'd be concerned about, lymphoid lesion. And then we do the pathology here, and, and what do you see at low power? I see a a lot of um, a large pro proliferation of blue cells. Okay, so what's the first rule of pathology? Way back to the intro, blue is bad. Okay, so blue is bad. So you see a lot of blue here, but if you look, what you can see is you can see that this is fairly uniform. And so you're not seeing, you know, areas where there's like follicles or big cells or small cells or light cells or dark cells. You've got these uniform kind of small to medium sized dark cells. And when we do some staining with a brown stain, with an amino peroxidase stain, what are we seeing here? Um, I'm actually not quite sure. Well, amino peroxidase stains certain antigens that are in the cytoplasm. And so sometimes when you're trying to do fresh tissue, this turns out to be an old fresh one. You lose the cellular detail, but you see that all of this cytoplasm is staining brown. And so basically what this tells us is that this is a lymphoma. And so when you're looking at uh, lymphomas, lymphomas can occur in the lacrimal gland, but they can also occur in the orbit. In fact, more commonly in the orbit, they can also occur in the lacrimal gland. And just like in the orbit, you don't have just one entity, okay, lymphoma sitting here. You've got a spectrum. So you've got an inflammatory lesion over here and a typical, uh, uh, you know, a, a mixed inflammation here. You've got an atypical lymphoid hyperplasia in the middle, and then you've got lymphoma on the other side. And that spectrum occurs both in the lacrimal gland and in the orbit in general. And so we do want to do amino peroxidase staining, or if you have fresh tissue, you can do what's called flow cytometry, and you want to characterize these. You want to say, okay, are these all B lymphocytes? Are they all T lymphocytes? Are they all kappa? Or are they all lambda? And this will give you a hint of whether or not this is a lymphoma or lymphoid hyperplasia, or even just a benign perforation. All right, back to, back to Brad. What do we see in here? So this is a color fundus photo, kind of what we were looking at of like choroidal folds. Okay, so what do choroidal folds tell you? Um, so it could be one of two things. I think the most uh, worrisome would be some sort of posterior mass, but then it could also be found in uh, hyper. Exactly, and it's what's really interesting when you, 
um, look at some of the studies they've done on astronauts that are in the um, space station for a long time, especially when, when Captain Kelly was up there for like a year. These guys will get a hyperopic shift and their globe will literally flatten out posteriorly and they've even documented, they, they took an OCT up there and, and they actually documented choroidal folds on there. So, you know, the most common thing is just someone who's hyperopic and has a flat globe. But what you don't want to miss is choroidal folds are a sign of a lesion behind the eye, but more specifically, where? Um, like in the uh, intraconal space. Intraconal, exactly. So when you start to see these choroidal folds, you worry about an intraconal mass lesion. And so last week we talked about optic nerve. And so obviously if you see an intraconal lesion, you want to worry about gliomas, meningiomas, even neurolimomas, schwannomas that we talked about last week. But when you see this, you worry about an intraconal lesion. Tina, we're looking at the CT. What are we seeing here? So here it looks like we have an intraconal lesion um, on the right-hand side. It looks like it's um, relatively well circumscribed, um, kind of similar to what we were looking at before. It doesn't look like it's got um, like out pouchings in different places, so it does look well circumscribed. Okay, this is a 28-year-old, vague symptoms of maybe pain around the eye, maybe some episodes where the vision washes out a little bit periodically. What would you think about a nice round lesion like this, minimal proptosis? So I'm kind of thinking of um, capillary hemangiomas, um, lymphangiomas. Okay, that first statement was Sorry. half right. Cavernous hemangiomas. Cavernous hemangiomas, exactly. So, Yep, so when you see a lesion that's well circumscribed like this, capillary hemangiomas really aren't well circumscribed. It's not the little amoebas that go all over, but cavernous hemangiomas, again, tend to have a pseudocapsule around them, and they tend to be pretty well circumscribed, and they can occur in the muscle cone most prominently. So this would be a concern for a possible cavernous hemangioma. We look at the pathology. Does this confirm it? Indeed, it does. So when you look at these at low power, this is just gross microscopy, they're surrounded by a pseudocapsule, and you've got these large vascular spaces, thus the name, cavernous, these cavernous vascular spaces. Now it's interesting in that they don't have a capsule around it, but we always say pseudocapsule. Pseudocapsule means the lesions grow slowly, it pushes the connective tissue around it, so when you go in and the, the ocular plastic guys go in to take these out, you could just shell these things right out. These just pop out whole. They look like a little grape in there, and you can just you can even put a cryoprobe on it, just pop them right out once you get to them. <coughs> this is what it looks like, low power microscopy. Again, large cavernous spaces filled with blood vessels, little thin septae coursing through them. All right, what am I illustrating here? Um, so it looks like a lot of red blood cells, um, and some of them look Okay, so what does that tell you when the, the red blood cells separate from the serum? That's a low flow movement. Exactly, and that's a key thing to remember with these is they're low flow. So a capillary hemangioma, so you've got a capillary hemangioma over the lid, it's extending in the orbit. You know, again, they've got all kinds of little blood vessels coming in and out of them. They bleed like crazy when you try to take them out. These are very, very low flow, and they're so low flow that you can see a gravity line here. So the red blood cells have settled out. This is like a hematocrit tube. So the red blood cells have settled out. You've got serum up here. So this tells you that these are very low flow lesions. They have these septae coursing through them. They grow very slowly, but again, because they're in the muscle cone, they can cause issues, cause problems. And so when you do take them out, they come out quite easily, which is good. And these are benign. So these are the cavernous type of hemangiomas, okay? Well, this is a more subtle one. What do we got here? And I know it's not 3D here, but you almost get the idea that that right eye is coming towards you a little bit. And so the hardest thing when someone shows you a picture like this, especially when you guys take boards, is the first thing you gotta figure out is, okay, what's the abnormal side? And when you look at it just initially, you, you say, I don't even know what's abnormal. But then 
like Boopy says, you want to look carefully at these because you often don't know what's gone. But if you look real carefully, you get the idea that maybe there's a little bit of increased scleral show inferiorly, a little bit more fullness there. You get the idea that that right globe is coming towards you a little bit more. And then we look at the pathology, and what the heck is this? Um, so there's this large um, staghorn shaped spaces, and um, between them is just a lot of other cells, so the background is just very cellular. Exactly, so a lot of cells in here, very, very cellular background, but you know, these are the staghorn spaces. You know, staghorn, like horns on a, on a deer, and so literally descriptive staghorn, but if you look carefully, there's all kinds of little spaces in here. And even at low power, you see that they all have red blood cells within them. So there's all kinds of little vascular spaces in here, some big, some little. But in between, there's this really dense cellular proliferation in between. What do you think that could be? Hemangiopericytoma. Exactly. So you can get hemangiopericytomas of the orbit, especially within the muscle cone. And it's a proliferation not only of the little blood vessel cells, of the endothelial cells, but also of the surrounding pericytes. And when you look closely at it, here's a little vascular space. There's all kinds of them around here. But then in between, you have this proliferation of these little pericytes. Now, this is, is kind of like the, you know, the lacrimal gland tumors in that you can get people will call these kind of benign and intermediate and more malignant. But what's weird about these, this is another one of those outliers you have, to, you have to realize. Even though we look at these and we try to grade them and we say, okay, this is intermediate, it's got the cleoli in it, it even looks more benign, it looks more malignant, that hasn't correlated to the prognosis of these lesions. So I find that really weird. I don't understand that in that you can see some of these that look really aggressive on pathology and they just sit there for years. You can see some that look more benign on pathology and they behave very aggressively. So if they really ask you on board, you know, tell, tell me about this, you can say that there are some that are benign and more intermediate, more aggressive, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to their prognosis. But what we have seen again in these, just like some of the lacrimal tumors, that these are tough to remove completely because they're not encapsulated. And we have seen through the years some that have gone from benign to intermediate <coughs> to malignant. And so if you leave them in there long enough, they can undergo a progression to a more aggressive looking cell. And these are tough to get out all the way, and they can come back and grow even more when you see them. So you can see this one tends to be an intermediate one. Look at the nucleoli, the clumped chromatin in there when you see them. But the key is it's this vascular network with the proliferation of the parasites in between. Now, what's a, what's a stain that we can do on these particular tumors that's helpful? We can do a reticulum stain. Ah, yeah, I, I, sorry, I'm one off. Okay, this just shows again the more malignant ones. There you go, there's the more malignant ones. And there's a really malignant one. There's the reticulum stain. Okay, so why is the reticulum stain important? Um, so it stains the reticular um, network that is produced by the Exactly. So remember, the pericytes, you know, really give the support to the blood vessels. And so when you get proliferation and hemangiopericytoma, you get this reticular network. People even call it net-like. So it looks like a little net. So when you do a reticulum stain, all that silvery black material is what you see. So this is really helpful when you're not sure what's going on. So you do the reticulum stain, you can see the network. So this is one that we were saying how it undergoes a progression. Here's a malignant-looking hemangiopericytoma, here's an intermediate looking one. You know, some nucleoli, some clumped chromatin, some pleomorphism, and then this one looks a lot more malignant. So they undergo that progression from kind of benign to intermediate to more malignant looking. And then you do the reticulum stain, and that helps you to um, differentiate this from other potential tumors. All right, what do we see in here? It looks like it's kind of intracaudal, but it's, it's spreading outwards and it's heterogeneous. All right, so the key is it's heterogeneous. It's not all uniform. You look, there's some areas that look kind of cystic, some that look solid, some that stain brightly, some that stain dull, and so it's kind of a mixture. It's a hodgepodge of 
stuff that's going on. But significant proptosis here. What if I told you this this person is 10? All right, so one of the things you'd be concerned about, another lesion that can occur in the orbit is a lymphangioma. And these tend to occur in young, young people, in kids, and they can really be variable. I mean, what I find is sometimes these kids can get a really explosive proptosis, or it can settle back in, and it can wax and wane. And even when these kids have an upper respiratory infection, their proptosis can get worse. Or if they have hemorrhaging into one of these little cysts, their proptosis can worsen. All right, so what do we characterize lymphangiomas by pathologically? So there's a very large uh, stack horn space, and then imperially there's uh, clumps of so B cells, so uh, it's like similar to like iron patches, it's got this uh, kind of reactive element. Okay, so these have these big spaces, they're lined by kind of a flattened, spindly endothelial lining. There's lots of vessels in here, so sometimes you can get bleeding in here, but the key is you see these, they almost look like little Peyer's patches of lymphocytes. And when kids get an upper respiratory infection, those can actually proliferate and swell. And so that's where you can get the intermittent proptosis that you can have in these, in these youngsters. And then what can happen is, is here, you can actually get bleeding into these large cystic spaces. And again, you'll get a very rapid increase in proptosis. Now, when people go in there to try to drain these, you know, they'll even try to you know, use the ultrasound or CT to guide a needle and get in there and drain them. And so when you drain them, because the blood in some of these has been sitting there for a while, it breaks down and so they're called chocolate cysts. So remember when red blood cells break down, they almost take on a brown appearance to them. So you don't want to try to go get in there and, and take these things out because again, they're, they're like amoebas, they have fingers everywhere. These are very difficult to take out because they're not encapsulated. And sometimes you take them out and the proptosis gets even temporarily worse. And so if you do get bleeding in a cyst that shows up on a scan, you can actually go in there and try to drain it to you know, relieve the pressure on the globe without having to go in and, and actually try to remove the tissue. So these are the so-called chocolate cysts you get when you get hemorrhaging into these large spaces in, the, in, the, um, in this lymphangioma lesion. There's a close-up. There's the Peyer's patch, lymphocytes. There are the various spaces that are filled with red blood cells, so the, the so-called chocolate cysts. Now, this is showing you those lymphocytes. And again, these kids, when they have an upper respiratory infection, can get a pretty rapid increase in their proptosis. All right, what do we see in right here, Rachel? So something, something bad is going on in there. I mean, and this was pretty rapid in onset. And you can see it's a younger person. It's a young, young child. Well, not young child, but, you know, a, a you know, grade school age child. And you've got this rapid increase of proptosis, hypoglobus, inward turning of the globe. And then you look at the scan and you do an, oh, my God. So what do we see in here? All right, so very rapidly growing orbital tumor in a child. What's the one thing you worry about most? <laughs> Rhabdomyosarcoma. Okay, so this, this child, this was right when I came here. This was 30 years ago. I don't know if you guys remember Laetrile. That was the miracle cure. Laetrile would cure all cancer and cure everything. And so this kid had a very, very small lesion about the size of your fingertip. Rick Anderson biopsied it. It was a rhabdo. And so they started the kid on chemo at Primary Children's. Kids started losing their hair, getting sick. So mom um, grabbed the kid, took him out of the hospital. They went to Mexico to a Laetrile clinic, you know, where they were going to be cured because, you know, the evil medical industrial complex in the U.S. wasn't letting this in. And so they went to Mexico for this miracle cure. Well, dad, who's divorced, hired a private investigator, found where mom had taken the kid, flew to Mexico, re-kidnapped the kid back, and brought the kid here. And this is what happened in three weeks. So this went from a lesion 
the size of your fingertip to this in three weeks. And so this kid needed an exenteration, needed to take out the whole lower but noble contents, really had a rough go of it, but, but you know, was still alive last I knew. And so this can really grow explosively. And so this is what shows you in an untreated rhabdomyosarcoma in three weeks what it can do. All right, now, I was going to talk about some of the different types of rhabdomyosarcomas, and, and these slides were made for a previous orbit conference, and they're so pretty, I actually left the, you know, the um, legends on the bottom of it. But still, this doesn't tell you exactly what kind this is, and so um, what are the um, different varieties of rhabdomyosarcoma that we need to think about? Okay. And uh, you also have albumin, which is the most, uh, the worst prognosis. And then uh, there's the, the Wotrui. Mm -hmm. Which I've never seen, by the way. I've never <laughs> and, seen. Uh, yep. So the, the TU2 you really want to remember is you want to remember the embryonal <laughs> type. That's the most common. And that's the type that has these kind of strap like kind of tadpole-looking cells, multiple nucleoli. Let's go a little bit of a close-up here. Boy, it's really interesting. On my screen, that shows up really nice, and it washes out up there. But what you see is you see these large, kind of round to tadpole-looking cells. They've got a lot of clumped chromatin, a lot of nucleoli, pleomorphism. Some are really big, some are really small. And so this is what we call the embryonal. This is the most common type. This is kind of in between in terms of prognosis. But still, they all have relatively bad prognosis, but this was the in between of all of them. Now, why are we showing this picture here, um, Teresa? What do we see in here on this tadpole? Um, well, there's definitely nucleoli and there's some nuclei. They're big. I don't think there's as much pleomorphism as the last picture. this? Yeah, but what do you see across the tail of that thing? Oh, uh, I could maybe hallucinate some striations. Exactly. So remember, these are embryologically derived muscle tumor cells. And so you can sometimes see in these embryonal ones, a little bit differentiated, you can actually see cross striations. So sometimes in the tail of the tadpole, you can see cross striations. And if you do, uh, a special stain, sometimes you can see these tadpoles better. So this is a special stain, this is a trichrome stain. Trichrome stain, you see the little, it looks like little uh, stripes on the Cheshire cat there. So you see these cross striations here. And so this is an embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma with the cross striations on a trichrome type stain. There's a really nice one. You can see the cross striations beautifully in there. All right, so these just show you some of the special stains we can do. And so because this is a muscle-derived tumor, you get um, staining with some of the muscle stains. And so vimentin, desmin, they will stain their amino peroxidase stains that stain positively for muscle-derived tumor cells. And so you can see that they've got the brown background cytoplasmic staining that you see in the amino peroxidase stains that are positive. All right, so Mike, see how good your short-term memory is here. What is, what's this particular variation of this tumor? Um, so this would be maybe the alveolar. It looks like kind of lung with the little spaces in there, I would guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is why it's named. It almost looks like alveoli. Remember when you used to look at lung path and you'd see the alveolar spaces? And so what you see is you see these little septae coming through here, and then you've got the cells in the middle of the little septae. So thus it looks more alveolar. And so this is uh, one you need to remember because this is particularly aggressive. So the alveolar variety, although rare, is very aggressive. And so if you see these, you really want to uh, be careful when you're treating these kids because these can be aggressive. They can spread very, very rapidly. So the al alveolar is the bad one and you can tell it because it looks like alveoli. And if you really use your imagination, it looks like a lung alveolus with tumor cells in it. And there you see amino peroxidase staining, you know, staining positive for one of the muscle, muscle antibodies. All right, 
What are we seeing here? Okay. Um, so the left eye looks very um, full, uh, erythematous. Um, it almost, it looks very inflamed. Yeah, so you see the eyes almost shut. Mm -hmm. And a younger person again, it looks really um, red and inflamed. What would your concern be here? Um, especially in a kid, you'd worry about like an orbital cellulitis. Okay. Uh, orbital cellulitis. Or so you'd worry about cellulitis. What else could give you a picture like this? Cellulitis. Well, let's say something non-infectious. Non-infectious. I'm not quite sure. So you could actually get a lesion that looks a lot like an orbital cellulitis in a kid that is actually what we used to call a pseudotumor. Now we call it idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome. But you can sometimes get a non-infectious variety that looks like this, and it's hard to tell the two apart. And so you don't want to miss a cellulitis in, in a kid, obviously, but sometimes you can get a lesion that looks a lot like it and it's an inflammatory lesion rather than an infectious lesion. And when you look at it, what you'll see is you'll see clumps of lymphocytes in here scattered in between the connective tissue, but it turns out that this was not infectious. This was not a cellulitis. This was an inflammatory lesion, and so this is, said we used to call this pseudotumor, but the word tumor is bad, I guess, and so we can't call it that, so now it's idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome, but it's the same idea. It is a proliferation of inflammatory cells, mostly lymphocytes, but what you'll see is you'll see some plasma cells mixed in there. You'll see some, it'll sometimes form even some follicles. There'll be blood vessels growing through this, and so not a lymphoma, Here's a close-up. Here's lymphocytes. There's a plasma cell. There's some vessels coursing through it. And so this is that benign. Remember we said, okay, lymphoma's over here. Idiopathic orbital inflammation is here. So this is the idiopathic orbital inflammation arm of that, of that particular lesion. And again, you can see scattered, you know, little multifocal clumps of inflammatory cells in here. Now, sometimes if these lesions go on long enough and they're not well treated, this can happen. What are we seeing right here? Um, so this looks like we have um, some fibrosis and scarring occurring. So this was an entity we again used to call sclerosing pseudotumor. So in the days before cortical steroids were around, these were horrible because you could get an entire socked in globe. I mean, it would be a socked in globe, it wouldn't move, it would squeeze off the blood supply. And so you can get a sclerosing, a fibrosing response to these in orbital inflammatory syndromes long term. And so you want to hit them pretty hard to try to calm them down before they get to the fibrotic phase or the sclerotic phase. And so if you don't, you can again get a sclerosing, a fibrosing pseudotumor, you know, orbital inflammation syndrome. Right, what do we see in here, Tina? external photograph kind of attention is drawn to the left eye which looks like it's um, based on the corneal reflex being kind of more of a hyperglobus so being pushed upwards you get an idea that maybe there's some fullness of the lower lid look at the little it's like almost the like maybe the, the eyes even pushing out a little bit so you know your concern is that maybe there's something going on behind there now again, you do the scan here, and what do you see right here? So it's hard to see, but it looks like the extracular muscles are enlarged there. I can't tell if that's actually in the muscle space or if that's just the tissue around it. But there's it's actually the tissue around it is, okay. is really there, but the key here is it's very diffuse. There's not really a particular lesion. It's very diffuse. And then we do the pathology, and what does this show? So, kind of sheets of small cells here that would be concerning for lymphocytes. All right, so this would be most, most consistent with a lymphoma. lymphoma. Yeah. So now, again, this is the spectrum from benign, you know, pseudotumor to lymphoma on this side. So when you look here, these are all uniform lymphocytes. There's no 
follicles in there, there's no blood vessels going through there, there's no plasma cells in there. And then when we do the aminoperoxidase stains, this stain's positive for, you know, monoclonal um, lymphocytes. And it's interesting in the orbit, most common are B lymphocytes. And they're usually extra zonal, you know, extra nodal zonal B lymphocytes. And so they're kind of a moderate grade B cell lymphoma. Very rare to have a T cell lymphoma of the, of the orbit. They're usually a moderate to low grade B cell lymphoma. All right, now this is a really ugly, ugly looking tumor there. What do what do I see right here? Yeah. First off, what kind of surgery gives you a something that looks this ugly? All right, so you've taken out the entire orbital and orbital contents. Um, just what are you seeing here with this diffuse coloration here? bluish and dark, what concern would that be for? Exactly. And so your concern is, remember the orbit is often a repository for tumor cells around it. And so it's pretty rare that you get, you know, primary tumor of the orbit, except, you know, the vascular ones we talked about, lymphomas. But because, you know, the orbit, what does it have in front of it? It's got lid, it's got conge, it's got sinuses around it. So you can often get secondary tumors going into the orbit. So malignant melanomas, you know, they usually will arise from either the lid or from the conge and then go into the orbit. So this particular patient had a, a conge melanoma that then invaded into the orbit. And so if you look right here, you see all of this, boy, this tumor is just everywhere in the orbit. And this is what it looks like at low power path. So you see again, you can't tell what kind of tumor cells these are, just at low power, but you can see that they're diffusely invading into the orbital connective tissue. So there's these big lobules of tumor cells everywhere. And when we look at the close-up, these turn out to be melanocytes. So again, when you look at a malignant tumor, sometimes they just look like big, you know, atypical cells. You can't tell what they are unless you do some immunoperoxidase staining. And so this particular one, there are stains that can tell you that it is melanocytic derived. So you see these big, atypical looking cells here in the orbit, and it turns out when you do the staining, these turned out to be melanoma. Now, there's other lesions that, that can involve the eyes. What the heck is this? Um, so this external photo looks like both the eyes look like they're parotidic, maybe the left more than the right. Um, in your scleral show, um, there's also some injection both uh, nasally and temporarily on both eyes, but again, worse on the left and the right. So it kind of seems consistent with the uh, thyroid eye disease picture. But this, this is a very timely photograph from Orbit Conference last night, so very timely photograph. And so this is a classic thyroid picture. And it's, they've got the surprise stare, you know, kind of the look you guys have when I come around and ask you randomly. <laughs> So you see that there's both superior and inferior scleral shows, some proptosis. You see the little inflammation in front of where the recti muscles insert. That's a real tip off. So, you know, pimp question again that you'll hear over and over again. What's the most common cause of unilateral proptosis in an adult? Thyroid What's the most common cause of bilateral proptosis in an adult? Thyroid eye disease. So thyroid eye disease, you always answer that. That's kind of like the you know, herpes of the cornea. No matter what question you're asked, you always say herpes when they show you a corneal lesion. So whenever they show you proptosis, well, of course, you know, you say thyroid is in the differential. So you say that offhandedly too. Well, of course, thyroid. And you say that while you're thinking of what else is in the differential diagnosis. So thyroid can give you this. And now here we have, again, the classic picture tendon spared anteriorly, body of the muscle. Now this one is a concern, even though again, they were showing those scans last night, and I, you know, they were saying, oh, this isn't bad. And I'm thinking, God, that, scare, that really scares me. <laughs> but look at these fat muscle bodies coming back, and they're even going back to the orbital apex. So you'd be concerned about you know, possible effect on the optic nerve when you've got large muscles like this, especially posteriorly. This is just one where they were doing a dissection on someone who had passed away. And see the, the tendon is spared. And then you've got the muscle body 
that is involved. And, you know, acutely you get this mixoid inflammation, you can get some hyaluronic acid in there, you get some mucopolysaccharide, you get swelling and you get a mixed inflammation. Lymphocytes, plasma cells, mixture in there acutely. But in the long term, if, if this doesn't get treated well, you can actually get fibrosis of the muscles, just like you get in the orbit with a normal inflammatory syndrome. So initially, you'll get the swelling, you'll get the myxoid type of change, you get the inflammation, but as these settle down, you get significant fibrosis, and that's where the patients get a lot of problems with diplopia. All right, boy, what the heck is this? This was removed from the orbit. This is a fellow's photograph, it's getting blurry. Exactly, it's blurry. So, yeah. yeah, but I don't take gross photos, so it has to be a fellow's <laughs> <by> definition. <laughs> so. Uh, so it's this, I mean, I can't tell the, the size relative with, uh, you know, to anything else, but um, it's kind of this, uh, maybe it's a cystic type or just kind of like a large kind of, a, you know, kind of a, a smooth looking kind of nodule or some type now, of What material. we were trying to show is with the light coming through here, this does transilluminate a little bit, so it is... It is fairly cystic, but there's not just clear liquid in there. I mean, there's some kind of material inside there, and so this is a cystic structure. And then we cut it in half, and it's kind of smelly and greasy, and it looks like this. Uh, so likely keratin-filled. All right, so it's all keratin-filled. So what lesion do you see that's, that's round like that in a child that's filled with keratin? Dermal All right, so remember we showed you the dermal limbal chorostomas, you know, of the, of the kind. So don't get the term dermoid confused. This is when most people talk about dermoid. This is what they're talking about. It's the dermoid cyst of the orbit. And why do, you, why do we think this happens? What do we think the etiology is? Um, like there's a penetrating injury of some type, and then it kind of encloses, and then the, the, the whole, all the dermal components kind of proliferate. Well, you... Kind of yeah, I can, but that's okay. So again, when you're hoof beats, you do horses, not so that's a zebra. So what's the most common? I don't remember. What do you think? They, they think that maybe this is some embryo embryological superficial ectoderm that gets pinched off. Because when you look, these are often along where the bony sutures are, and they think that there'll be some, some surface ectoderm gets pinched off and then it just slowly grows over time. And when you look at these, like, yeah, God, another, I gotta get you guys, you know, LASIK trained, you know, get some, <laughs> get some PRKs done on you guys. So this is a... Because we, we can still accommodate. That's, that's right, you guys are accommodating through the scope when you take these pictures. So these lesions, a, a dermoid cyst, you've got this epithelial lining, it's filled with keratin, but the key is you have the dermal appendages, and so that's the tip-off. You can sometimes get traumatically placed epithelium into the orbit, and you'll get an epithelioid cyst with just surface epithelium and keratin. But when you have the dermal appendages, here's a hair follicle, here's a sebaceous gland, that is what forms a dermoid, an orbital dermoid in a kid. So it's not only the epithelium, but it's the dermal appendages with it. And we say goodbye to the Schoenbrunn Zoo at Vienna. So next week is tumors. So tumors, know your tumors, and then the week after that, we'll do an OCAP review, and then good luck on OCAPs. <laughs>